seat and be quiet so we can get started. We do have some students that have to leave at 11, so we want to make sure they get to hear this presentation. We have with us today Rachel Goldman Miller, who spent much of her childhood in constant fear. As one of the countless hidden children of the Holocaust, Miller had to conceal her identity from friends, neighbors, and the authorities. Though she survived, her mother, father, and three siblings did not. To honor their memory and the memory of more than six million innocent people who died in Nazi concentration camps, Rachel Miller continues to tell her story. Miller emigrated to the United States in 1946 and eventually married and raised a family. She now lives in the St. Louis metro area and regularly speaks about her experiences. Please help me in welcoming Rachel Goldman Miller to Linmar this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Good morning, everybody. Wow, what a group, wonderful group. My name is Rachel Miller. It's really Rachel in French. Goldman is my maiden name and Miller is my married name. I was the youngest of four children and I was the only one that was born in France. My family came from Warsaw, Poland. My father was a barber. My mother was a housewife. I had two brothers, Adolphe, Henri, and my sister Sabine. They had, there was a lot of anti-Semitism and they wanted my father to serve in the Polish army. So he decided to move to France and the reason he decided to move to France is because he had a brother and a sister living there and my mother had two brothers. They were very family oriented. They arrived in Paris in 1932 and must have been quite a shock to my mother for only one reason. They had a lovely, lovely home in Warsaw with help and so forth and so on. And now they were living in Paris with no running water. My mother had, we lived on the first floor. My mother had to go up to the second floor to get the water. And uh, three, five people living in a two-room apartment was a little difficult. And then I arrived in 1933. I was the surprise. All I can remember as a little girl is nothing but love, happiness, and joy. We'd get together on Saturday night with my aunts, my uncles, and our cousins, and we'd sing in three different languages. We sang in French, we sang in Yiddish, and we sang in Polish. It was such a wonderful time. I just loved, I just loved Saturday night because we'd get together with everybody. With that, I'm gonna show you some pictures of my family. This is my Aunt Rose, and you're gonna, hear, you're gonna hear a lot about her. This is her sister, Eva. This is my paternal grandfather, my paternal grandmother, and this is my oldest brother, Adolf. This is my mother with one of her sisters, my mother with one of her sisters, and I don't know who this is, it's either a brother or sister. This is their engagement picture. And this is their wedding announcement. They were married in March of 1923. My mother, Adolphe, Henri, and Sabine. This is my mother's sister. I have a lot of her pictures. I think she was a favorite. This is my maternal grandmother with my sister, Sabine. She was very, very beautiful. She had blonde hair and brown eyes. She was beautiful outside, but most importantly, she was beautiful on the inside. A wonderful, wonderful sister. This is my father. This is my mother. This is my mother's brother, Aaron, who I did know. He did come to Paris. This is his wife and my little cousin, and unfortunately, I don't remember their names. My maternal grandmother, and these are my brothers and my sister. My mother, my father, my paternal grandmother, Adolphe Henri and Sabine. I thought we were very poor, but I guess we were not as poor as I thought we were because we managed to go to the country. So here we are. This is my father. This is my mother. This is my brother, Adolphe. This is Henri. This is Sabine, and this is me. This is my sister, Sabine, and this is me. And when I look at those pictures, it really warms my heart for only one reason. The fact that we shared that together and the fact that I absolutely adored her because she was my idol. 
makes me so happy that we had that. She was really special. This is my mother in the country. This is my mother with my aunt, my aunt Rose. This is my mother's other brother, Jules, and his wife, Fanny. And this is my cousin, Michelle. And I don't remember those three little fa beautiful faces. I don't remember their names, my little cousins. This looks like a school picture for my brother, for my two brothers, and these are, again, us in the country. This is the Jewish quarter in Paris prior to the war. It was a very vibrant area. You could buy from a needle to a house. There was nothing that you could not find there. I was there about nine years ago. I will not go back to France. I renounced my French citizenship. As I keep learning about history, I find out that the French were collaborating with the Nazis in such a way that they actually gave them some ideas as to what to do with the Jews. So I am not interested in being a French person. About, about, this is, I was going to say, <laughs> you went too fast. Uh, about, as I mentioned, nine years ago I was there. It was about two blocks long. They're beginning to gentrify the area. Thank you, Sherry. My father didn't serve in the Polish army, but wound up serving in the French army. It was a Sunday morning, and it was the only day that my father was off. I was sitting on the buffet by the window, and my father was cutting my hair, and I heard him say to my mother, it's beginning of June. That was the day that Germany invaded Poland. That was September 1, 1939. For me, it meant nothing, but it registered. I forgot all about it, and things were normal, went to school, played with my friends, and so forth and so on. A year later, I heard of this parade. As a kid, who doesn't like to see a parade? I'm not any different. I ran downstairs and wiggled myself in front of everybody so I could see this parade. And when I saw this parade, what is this noise? Is it me? It's, is it the mic? So um, as the, uh, I wiggled myself in front of everybody so I could see this parade. And when I saw these robots, and I know we didn't have robots in 1940, but let me tell you, they were robots. I'm going to take off my glasses that makes a difference. Um, when I saw them, it ju I just started to cry, and I, and I began to cry, and I kept saying, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. I ran upstairs, and my mother and my father asked me what was wrong with me, and I said, I'm so afraid, I'm so afraid, and I was crying, did anybody hurt you? No, 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 I'm afraid, that's all I kept saying. That was the day that Marshal Pétain made a deal with Hitler. If they came into France and did not bomb us, they would welcome them with open arms, and with open arms they did. They had flowers, they had wine, they had candy, they had kisses, they had everything you could possibly imagine. This is Lac de Triomphe, it's on Les Champs-Élysées, and you can see the German soldiers walking by. But for Hitler to be able to walk through Lac de Triomphe must have been total, total ecstasy because they lost World War I and they were paying restitution to all the countries that they had ravaged. Now it was his turn as the conqueror to take back everything that they had sent to the various countries and sending it to Germany. I forgot about it. Went to school, played with my friends, everything was normal, and that was it. Forgot that I had been afraid. A year later, let me tell you about our house. We had two huge black double doors. Within the double doors, there was a courtyard in the shape of a U, and we lived in, num in building number A, and it went B, C, D, and so forth and so on. A lot of commotion in the yard. French police and SS 
men. With that, our neighbor, Monsieur Martin. came knocking at our door and said, Monsieur Goldman, please come with me. They're picking up the Jews and taking them to a labor camp. My father did not question it. He took a suitcase, filled it with his clothes. These are the straps that were around his suitcase and started to walk across to Monsieur Martin. When, mi when Monsieur Maurice in building number C saw my father trying to get away, told the police and the SS that he was trying to get away. They picked him up right there in the yard. They came looking for my two brothers. Adolphe was now 18 and Henri was 16. The reason I told you we had no running water is because we had one of those enamel bathtubs. My mother hid my two brothers under the bed and put this enamel bathtub in front of them. I'm sure the inspector must have seen them, but decided not to see them. So on that day, my father was taken away. His brother Leon was taken away. And my Aunt Rose's husband was taken away by mistake. Why do I say that? Marshal Pétain made a deal with Hitler that they could take away all the Poles, Russians, Hungarian, Lithuanians, and so forth and so on, but they were to leave the French Jews alone. My uncle was born in a place called Drancy, which is about 100 kilometers outside of Paris. In those days, only rich people had telephones. Only rich people had cars. The reason we all lived so, we were so close, we all lived very close to one another. My uncle heard what was going on. He started walking towards our house. He was stopped in the street and they said, where are you going? He says, I'm going to visit my family. Are you French? Yes, I am. What's your name? Salomon Yorkovich. Drop your pants. And because he was circumcised, he too was taken on that day. They were taken to the camp, Drancy, which is actually the place where my uncle was born. We're going to go back to, we're going to skip two. That's it. This is a letter from my uncle. This is the size of the actual letter. And he starts, but dear wife and daughter, I received your letter and I'm so happy to hear from you and, and so forth and so on. And over here he mentions my father who also received the cap means letter, fam means wife, Colleen means package, nourriture means food from his, from his wife, which they needed very badly. My uncle did not have the opportunity to put a suitcase together, so he's asking for all kinds of sundries. And he had a cold, but most of all, he's asking for cigarettes because he was a smoker. I don't know how my mother or my aunt were able to get him out of that camp, but they did. They were taken to L'Hôpital Tonneau, which is on the right bank of Paris. They had um, major, major surgery. They did very well. They wanted to come home to their family. Now an edict came out. Only the French Jews could stay in this hospital. All the others had to be moved. And my father was moved to L'Hôpital Rochechil, which is on the left bank of Paris. He was, he was moved in an open wagon, in a paddy wagon, I'm sorry. And I don't know, he developed something, I don't know what it was. But the good thing about it is that we were allowed to see them three hours a week. So one hour my mother would go by herself, another time she'd take my brothers, another time she'd take my sister and I. I went to see my father on December 28th. I was so excited, he was coming home New Year's Day. As far as I was concerned, we would have our get-togethers again, and it would be just the way it was. My mother went to see him on December 30th. He told her that at 10 o'clock in the morning, he had been injected with something, and he died in her arms, Tuesday, December 30th, 1941, at 2 p.m. My uncle, who was at L'Hôpital Tonneau, told my Aunt Rose, 
that at 10 o'clock in the morning, he had been injected with something, and he died in her arms, Tuesday, December 30th, 1941, at 2 p.m. It took us a while to get together to find out what really happened. We couldn't believe what was going on. Finally, we found out that both of them were dead. They were actually experimented upon. I found this out about 45 years ago. They were injected with gas. They had a funeral of 1,500 people. We did not know 1,500 people. This is their grave. It holds about 30 coffins. My father's name is right about there with my uncle. This is my Aunt Rose. This is me prior to coming to the United States. This is my cousin Arlette, my aunt's daughter. This is my uncle's sister, and this is his niece. And this is me, and this is Arlette. I don't have to tell you there was no more get-togethers. There was no more anything. My house was really, really very sad. But I also want you to know something. There is a myth that the Jews went without fighting. If we can go back to one more. And I want to correct that. This is 1942. This is now my older brother, Adolf. If I take away A-N-C-E in unison, let me hear what it says. Exactly. Resist. Do you, of course, we all know what resist means. It means to fight back, to push back. That's exactly what they were doing. They were resistance fighters. So this is my brother, Adolf, and this is my cousin, Ulen. She was, taken pris she was taken prisoner in 1944. She was carrying, carrying 17 guns and 17 identification papers that she was bringing to the resistance, to the underground. She was tortured for three solid days. She's got two holes in between her breast, complement of the SS. She never revealed where she was taking the papers of the gun. She's my hero. She lives in Paris today. She's 94 years old. She had a very, very difficult life. This is Jean. Jean actually escaped Auschwitz once. He was recaptured in 1943. When the war was coming to an end, in January of 1945, to March of 1945, the Germans took 100,000, and I call them skeletons. The reason I call them skeletons is because if you are fed 180 calories a day and you start to work from 6 o'clock in the morning until 9.30 at night, how can you actually survive? So out of the 100,000 people on the march, only 10,000 survived, and Jean was one of them. Because he survived, because he had been in the resistance, because he had been in Auschwitz, he was decorated by Prime Minister Mitterrand. This is my brother again, and I don't know who these other gentlemen are. I assume they are resistance fighters as well. I'm very proud to say that my family fought back the Germans in 1942. I'm very proud of them. My Aunt Rose and my cousin Arlette that's their passport. And this is the last picture of Sabine and I. As you see, we are dressed alike. As I mentioned before, she had beautiful blonde hair, brown eyes, and she had a pockmark right there. She was so beautiful. I miss her still. As I mentioned before, my house was sad. And School was coming to an end, and my mother said to me, Rachel, I'm going to send you to the country. I was so happy. My sister Sabine was supposed to come with me, 
Her birthday was July the 15th. My Aunt Rose promised her a handbag, but she had to be in Paris to receive it. So Sabine decided that she would arrive on July the 18th. Cecile and I, my best friend, were to leave on the 13th. The night before, my mother said to me, Rachel, I'm going to give you a new name. Your new, new, new name is going to be Christine, and you're not allowed to tell anyone that you're Jewish. The only one that will know that you're Jewish is the farmer where you're going and your friend Cecile because she wasn't Jewish. If I'd ever lie, I would have been punished, but I accepted it without any question. So on the 13th, Cecile and I went away to the country, and it was wonderful for a day and a half. Kids were playing, there was music, there were animals, it was great, it was a farm. A day and a half later, Kids came up and they started to talk about this big raid that they're going to have to pick up the Jews. I became very frightened. I started to cry and I went to my bed and I forgot about it. On the 18th, I went to the bus to pick up Sabine. Instead, Cecile's mother got off the bus. So I, said, I asked her, I said, where is Sabine? She says, oh, she went shopping. I says, in our family, when we make a promise, we keep our word. And I started to ask all kinds of questions. Finally, I said, where is my doll? And she says, what doll? I said, I forgot to take it, and Sabine was supposed to bring it. She says, well, she didn't give it to me. So we started to walk towards the farm, which seemed like an eternity. I ran in, and I said, if you don't tell me what happened to my family, I'm going to run away to Paris. Madame Thiel told me that on July the 16th, they picked up my mother, my brother adult, my brother Henri, and my sister Sabine. I started to cry. I was terrified. I was also angry at my mother. Why did she not keep me with her? My mother loved me very much. Had she kept me with her, I would not be here this moment telling you my story. What was going to happen to me? I was nine years old, under an assumed name, no money. Who's going to take care of me? I cried and cried and cried for weeks. Finally, I got a letter from my Aunt Rose, who was in hiding with my cousin, and she told me that as soon as it would be safe, she would take me back to Paris. Nanida came out. Anyone hiding a Jewish child, if you will report them to the police, they will give you 300 francs. This farmer, whose name I do not remember, but bless her soul every time I tell my story, wrote a letter to my aunt asking permission as to whether or not she should report me to the police. My aunt sent her the 300 francs, so as a result, I was saved twice, once by my mother and once by this farmer. Things quieted down and my aunt brought me back to Paris. The first thing I wanted to do when I got to Paris was to go to my house. When I got to my house, that was the day they were looting our apartment. I asked permission if I could go upstairs to get the pictures of my family. The Germans said no and the French said no, but Madame Thiel, Cecile's mother, spoke German. She was from Alsace-Lorraine. And she said, what are you going to do with the pictures? You're going to burn them anyway. So why don't you let her go upstairs to get them? So that's exactly what I did. At the age of nine years old, I went upstairs and I got pictures of my family. And I walked out of the house. I did not take my doll. I just took what was the most important thing to me, which are pictures that you can never, never replace. I am so lucky. I went to live with my aunt, and now Anita came out. Anyone over the age of six had to wear a star. And the star is two triangles in yellow, trimmed in black, and in the middle, it says Jew. In French, it's J-U-I-F. What did that mean? It meant we had a curfew of 8 o'clock at night. It meant 
that we had to go grocery shopping between the hours of three and four. It meant that sometimes I could go to school, sometimes I could not. It meant that my aunt sometimes could go to work, sometimes it could not. It had to be sewn on the outerwear and it had to be exactly a certain distance from the shoulder to the star. It had to be exact. Things were getting pretty bad. There was a knock at the door. It was a German soldier in civilian clothes. When my family was taken away, they were taken to a convention center, it was called Val de Vere. Would it be comfortable to any convention center that you might be going to? They had 17,000 people plus from all ages, from children, babies, to seniors, elderly. It had six bathrooms, three of which faced the streets, so they closed up the three bathrooms. I want you to close your eyes for a moment and think how you have to go to the bathroom and there are 17,000 people in front of you trying to go to the bathroom, how you would feel. So, can you imagine the situation of people with no sanitation, with no water, with no food? From there, they were sent to a holding camp called Pithiviers, which is about 250 kilometers out, out of Paris. This is where this German soldier saw my sister. She had just turned 15. He fell in love with her, and he wanted to marry her. He brought out three letters, but my aunt burnt the letters because every time I found them, I was hysterical. I do, however, have part of one of her letters imprinted in my brain. That was the day, she writes, of how they shaved my mother's beautiful bla bla black hair, Henri's hair, a dove's, and, she and hers. She was sick and she wanted out. By the time he went back to Ausch by the time he went back to PTV, she was on a convoy to Auschwitz. And that was the last time that I heard from my family. We were in a cellar for five days with rats running around us. To this day, I am terrified of mice. I actually moved out of a house because we had mice. I was 50 years old. I was, afraid of t I was afraid of the dark until I was 50 years old. I was afraid of dogs until I was 50 years old. I wet the bed till I was 13 and a half. I was afraid of everything. I used to go to sleep with cotton in my ears. I was afraid, always afraid. My aunt kept hearing of different things about family, about being taken away. Oh, this is where we have to stop.
would hear of a raid and she would hide us. I was in a convent for a year and a half. I was almost baptized and had my first communion. By the way, through the whole war, I had lice for malnutrition. I was, th as I mentioned, I was there for a year and a half. I remember green apples and those spiral stairways, and we used to tell our prayers five times a day. The mother superior, the, rather my aunt did not want us to be baptized and have our first communion, so the mother superior asked us to leave, so we did. So when I was in the convent, I was Christine. When I was with my aunt, I was Rachel. I was changing identity. When I was Christine, I was afraid they'd find out that I was Jewish and they would take me away because I was lying and trying to be something I was not. When I was Jewish, when I was with my aunt and I was Jewish, I was afraid they'd take me away because I was Jewish. So it was always, always fear. I was with my aunt. It was very cold. My hands and my feet used to crack open and bleed. I was waiting online. My aunt was sick, she had pleurisy. So the doctor suggested that she might like to have an apple. It was about five minutes to four and this woman butt herself in front of me. I gingerly tapped her and I said, Excuse me, madam, I've been waiting online. And she looked at my star and she said, you filthy Jew, you have the audacity to tell me that I haven't been waiting online. I'm going to call the Germans and they're going to take you away. I started to beg, plead, and so forth and so on. I was practically on my knees. And by the time it was my turn, it was too late. I could not get that piece of fruit to my aunt. I walked back and cried all the way. And I promised myself when the war would be over, I would speak up. I didn't tell you that the Germans and the French thought that we were vermin. We were worthless. No right to exist. If I was on a sidewalk and a German soldier would come onto the sidewalk, I had to go into the street because if by mistake I would have had contact with him and he didn't like the contact that I would have had with him and if he didn't like the way my star was on my coat, he could send me away. As I, I kept changing identities when I was in hiding and so forth and so on throughout the war. What were they doing with all these people? Where were they sending them? What were they doing with them? There's some more people coming in. What were they doing with them? A woman with her daughter jumped out the window She was smart. She evaded the horrors because she must have known what was waiting for her. So she saved her little girl. She must have loved her very much. And things went on throughout the war. They kept taking the Jews. And Oh, I also want to tell you, the Germans killed 23 million people. 23 million people. They started with people with mental disabilities, with people with physical disabilities. They wanted a blonde eye, blue eye civilization. That's what, we're, that's what they were aiming for. They killed gays. They killed gypsies. They killed Jehovah Witnesses, they killed Russians. They killed and they killed and they killed. 23 million people. Of course, they killed 6 million Jews and 1.5 and million children, which some of you 
represent one and a half million children. How could they do that? Such an intelligent, educated, cultured civilization. They're not a new civilization, they're an old civilization. How could they do all these things? How could a German soldier go to work in the morning on the camp, in the concentration camp, commit all kinds of horrors, come home at the end of the day, have dinner with his family, his children, listen to music, and make believe that nothing has happened. How could they do that? They did that for so many years, and they killed and they killed. June 6, 1944, a wonderful day, but not quite the beginning of the end. That was the day that German that the Americans invaded Normandy. That was also the Australians and the British. It was a horrific day for our soldiers, and we honor them. We honor their memories. But it was the beginning. Till the very last day, they were picking up Jews and taking them to wherever concentration camps. My aunt became very nervous because by then most of the European Jews were gone and only the French Jews were left. She heard of this orphanage. Let's go to the next slide. We'll come back to this one. This is the orphanage. We were 60 children whose parents had been deported. Three parents came back, not three sets of parents, but three parents came back. This is me over here. And this is my cousin. This is me over here, and we're dancing. We were putting on a show for May the 3rd, and I'm not in this picture. An American soldier happened to be walking by and heard children playing. Oh, I'm, I'm doing this. <laughs> I just realized I'm the one that's doing this. So he heard children playing. He went. He came in the orphanage and asked to speak to the director, and the director told him that we were children whose parents had been deported. And he asked to speak to one of them. The director called me and asked me to come and recite a poem that I was to recite on May the 3rd. The American soldier asked if he could bring people from the base, and that's when he brought, we can go back and see Malvina, one of the nurses, and she washed our hair, and she took out all the lice that we had. She had something that worked. And this is me, and this is Arlette. We were with her. This is me, and that's Arlette, and that's my aunt, me, and Arlette. And they bought all kinds of things, ice cream, candy. They bought grapefruits, and we didn't know how to eat it, so we bit into it, and we did not like it at all. We told them to take it back. Tasted terrible. Anyway, we put on the show, and thereafter there were three soldiers that wanted to bring me to the United States. There was Harry, there was George, and then there was a little soldier from Texas. However, I had met Harry, and I knew him well. He started molesting me. I was 11 and a half years old. All I can say about Harry is that he brought me to the United States. You can show the picture very quickly. The next one. That's it. Very quickly. Thank you. All I can say about Harry is that he brought me to the United States, and for that I'm grateful. He met me at the airport with his, I mean at the ship, with his wife and daughter. He continued to molest me while I was in the house for nine and a half months. His wife threw me out. I was in five different foster homes until I was married. I was married at the age of 17. This is me. I was still living with Harry at the time. This is him. He was in, couldn't live in civilian life. He had to get back into the army. That's my passport picture. This is my cousin. She's the sister to my 
cousin who suffered in the concentration camp and has the two holes in between her breasts. She committed suicide. She had a terrible life. This is me, and I don't know who this woman is. When the war was over, we searched for families. I lost 93 people in the war. I did not know all the 93 people. I'm counting the families from Poland. Nobody came back. Nobody. The Germans kept accurate records of what they were doing. When the war was finally over, it was the Russians who liberated Auschwitz. The Russians, rather the Germans, kept accurate record of everything they were doing. So, what they did is that Auschwitz, there's a sign that says, Arbeit macht frei. It means work makes you free. They had an orchestra playing Beethoven, Wagner, and Mozart. Plus, they had the dogs ready to attack at any moment if you fell out of file. They would know, I call it a manifest. You want to help me, Sherry? So they can see it. Thank you. They would know how many people were in the cattle car. Each cattle car had between 150 to 200 people. Now, just take into, and they had a pot in case somebody got sick or had to go to the bathroom. This is a whole cattle car. They were like sardines. After having been in Belle d'Hiver, with no sanitation. After having been in PTV, where my sister said they were sick and, and, wa and wanted out, they already knew by this manifest who was going to go to work. If you were between the age of 16 and 40 and you were tall, the likelihood is that they would tell you to go to the, to the right could be the left, I don't know. Let's say it's to the right. They had you grouped by country, by age, and by gender. If you were sickly, they would say to you, you're going to go take a shower. There, too, they would have an orchestra playing and a dog ready to attack. They would tell you to fold your clothes very, very neatly. Fold them tie your shoes together so when you come out, you will find your clothes. They would then drop the gas pallets in the showers. People became asphyxiated, and from there, they would have the skeletons again go through the body for diamonds, for money, and for gold. After they went through the bodies, they would send them into the crematorium. So, what happened is, I'll jump, I'll show you the document. This is for my two brothers. Can I get the whole slide? Pardon me? Can I get the whole slide? No, 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 we'll, okay. we'll come to that. Thank you. This is for my mother. And this is for my sister. Thank you, Sherry. So now, this is the document for my mother. It's Goldman Hajar, it's Hélène in French. She was born 1901, Paris, to Camp Pitivier, U to concentration camp on the 6th and 7th of August, 1942. This is for my brother, Adolphe. Goldman. He was born April 20th, 1924, in Warsaw, to Newton Haja. Rabinovich is my mother's maiden name. Paris 11, Rue du Faubourg Saint-Antoine, 275. 
to Camp PTV, U to concentration camp Auschwitz on the 30th, 31st July 1942. That day on the 17th of October 1942 at 9.30 p.m., cause of death, enteritis with bodily weakness. For my brother Henri, Hirsch, he was born August 29, 1926, Warsaw, to Nuta Rajane Rabinovich, Paris 11, Faubourg Saint Antoine, the South 75, to Camp PTV, U, to concentration camp on the 30, 31st July 1942, died there on the 5th of January 1943 at 4.25 p.m., cause of death myocardial weakness. This is Goldman Sabine, July 15, 1929. This is incorrect. It should be Warsaw, Paris de saint soixante Faubourg Saint-Antoine, to concentration camp, Auschwitz, 19th of August, 1942. Why don't you see for my mother and for my sister? Who said it? Yes, you are correct. What's your name? Said it. Don't want to. They don't want to tell me their name. Okay. They're too shy. I'm sorry. They're too shy. Oh, okay. Because I wanted to congratulate them for paying attention. The reason you don't see a death certificate for my mother and for my sister is because when they arrived at Auschwitz, as I mentioned before, they went to the showers. And I am so glad, I know it sounds ridiculous to use that word, but I am so glad that they didn't have to suffer any longer, and I'm so sorry that my brothers had to suffer so long in the camp. Now the death certificates that they had What they put down on the death certificates, they'd open up a medical book, and whatever sounded right to them, they'd put on the medical book, because they didn't want people to know what they were doing. This is my family. I probably have some water. Do I have any questions? Do we? Oh, yes. Can you? Do we have a? Um. Hi. hi. How old? What's your name, dear? I'm Adeline. Hi. Um. How? Stand up. Okay. How old were your siblings when they were sent to Auschwitz? My older brother, Adolf, was 18. Henri was 16, and Sabine was 15. So this is my family. This is my older son, Neil. He's a lawyer and and he was a retired lawyer and prosecutor. This is his wife, Marcy. She's also a lawyer. She's retired. This is uh, my oldest granddaughter. She is now a lawyer in New York. This is my youngest granddaughter. She works for a cosmetic company in New York. This is me. This is my husband. He died on the same day as my father. This is my son, Mark. He was also a lawyer. He was gay, and he died of AIDS. That is my second, second Holocaust. This is Mark before he was sick. He was a student of Princeton and Yale. This is a bar mitzvah. How many of you have gone to bar mitzvahs? Raise your hand, don't be shy. Good. A bar mitzvah, in the olden days, when you were 13, you had the rite of passage, and you went to work. Because in the older days, that's the way it was. 
and now we still celebrate it, and it's a very important day in a boy's life, and now we even have bat mitzvahs for girls. And this was Isaac's bar mitzvah. This is my husband, he's sick over here. This is my son, Neil. This is his wife. This is my granddaughters. And this is me. This is Mark's panel. He worked for Warner Brothers. He, as I mentioned, he was also a lawyer. And the general counsel approved the characters for the panel. And this is Mark's picture in the middle. 1957-1992. It was the paralegals that made his panel. I did the, what is called the March of the Living. I wanted to see what it was like in the concentration camp, what my family went through. There is something I should tell you. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's called the Warsaw Ghetto. In 1943, young people fought 23 days with their bare hands fighting the Germans. The only way that the Germans could stop them from fighting was to burn down the whole city of Warsaw to the ground, and that's exactly what they did. So all of this street is all new. This is approximately the street where my parents, not, it's not approximately, this is actually the street where my parents were married. This, is, this would be approximately the building where they would have been married, and someone asked me to stand there because right above it, it says Miller's Art. Next one. We never had birthday parties. We never had anything. Do you know what I got when Hanukkah popped? for one Hanukkah, the best present I ever got in my life, an orange. I had not seen an orange in four and a half years. That was the very, very best present I ever got. We lost Trudy. This is all of us. I used to live in California, and that's, what, that's where we had this, this slumber party. It was wonderful. This is my story. I want to thank you. You were so wonderful and so attentive. Thank you so much. And <laughs> if, they, if they want questions, I'll answer them. Hi, my Hello. name is Michaela. I was just wondering, what age were you when the Holocaust was over? Uh, I, like, like, how old were you? When the Holocaust started? When it, when it ended. When it ended, I was 11 and a half. Other questions? Has one. Uh, Sherry, would you t ask them to tell me their name? I'd like to address them properly, please. Um, who, does somebody have a microphone over there? She would like you to tell her your name and then ask her your question, please. My name is Ashley, and I was wondering what happened to your Aunt Rose. What happened to your Aunt Rose? My Aunt Rose came to the United States in 1950. That was the year that I got married. She came in June, and we were married in September and she came with my cousin. And she passed away uh, on our 40th anniversary, that would be, she passed away in 1990. Thank you for the question. Hi, I'm Zach. Um, how long were your brothers able to fight in the Paris resistance? I have to um, How long were your brothers able to fight in the resistance? Yes. As soon as my father died, I think that's when they started fighting. But my father died at the end of 1941, so they started fighting in 1942, very early on, until they were taken away in 1942. 
They basically fought from January 1st till July of 1942. Hi, my name's Riley. Um, are you still in contact with your cousin that was tortured for three days? Yes, I am. In, uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear the name. I have trouble hearing. Riley? Riley. Thank you, Riley. Uh, my cousin is still living. She's 94 years old. She's in Paris. But she's had a really, very, very difficult life. Very difficult life. Hi, uh, my name is Leah. What's her name? My name's Leah. And Leah? I was wondering how old were you when you immigrated to the U.S.? I was 13 and Leo, I was 13 and a half when I came to the United States. They want to know about the doll. Oh. Can you talk about your doll? Oh, well, who's asking about the doll? Carol you said, all. remind her to tell about the doll. <laughs> <laughs> Jim and Carol. Oh, thank you. When Mark died, the paralegal were the ones that made the panel for him. And as I mentioned before, the general counsel approved the panel. There were seven of them. And we befriended them, and we started taking them to lunch because they were doing such a wonderful thing for Mark. And this gal, Suzanne Mazel, decided to write a play about Mark. Mark wore always these wonderful ties, and they used to tease, tease him about the tie. So she found out that I was also a Holocaust survivor, so she decided that she was going to write a play about Mark and I, and it's called Beyond Me. It was shown in California 10 times and twice in St. Louis. Suzanne and I went to Paris to see where I lived, where I played with in the park when I was there with my family. By the way, the school that I went to, 1,259 girls were murdered from the age of six to 12. 1,259 girls for only one reason, because they were Jewish. At the end of the day, Cecile, uh, at the end of the day, Suzanne and I went to the flea market, and I saw this doll, and she was in a box, and I said to the salesperson, I want her. So I bought her, and I brought her back to St. Louis, going to a party, and I said to a friend of mine, I bought myself a doll. She says, bring her. So one of the people turned the tag around for me. What's your name? Erica, do you want to turn the tag around for me? What was my name when I was in hiding? Very good, Christine. Who did I go away with, my best friend? Cecile, very, very good. Guess what the doll's name is? Christine Cecile. When I bought her, I didn't know that was her name. This is why I bring her. She's very, very important. So thank you for asking, Jim and Carol. Get your answers. Hi, I'm Tiffany. Um, I had a question of what was your life like once you moved here to the United States? Like, what did you do for a job? Um, how did you meet your husband? Kind of that kind of thing. What was my life? What's her name? Yeah, well, Tiffany. Tiffany. What was your job like here when you moved? And how did you meet your husband? Thank you, Tiffany. When I came to America, I went to school. I, when I was 13 and a half and I was a sophomore. I could have graduated when I was 16 and a half, but I graduated at 17 because I shouldn't tell you this, but I will tell you. I flunked one 
whole semester. Yeah, I shouldn't be telling you, but that's the truth. I had a very, very difficult life. I didn't work part-time. In the fourth foster home I was in is where I met my husband. Their middle daughter was my friend, and she asked me to come and move, to come and live with them. And that's what I did. It was a good thing in the sense that I met my husband, but her mother was very abusive. It was not a good place. I married, I married into my husband's family. He was very, very wonderful, and I had a wonderful, wonderful family. He, comes from a, he came from a family of six. There are still two living, and I'm in touch with them, and I'm very close to them. So thank you for asking, Tiffany. Does that answer your question? Good. Hi, Michaela again. Um, this is my last question, probably, but why was that orange your favorite gift? Why was the orange your favorite gift? That was the only one I had. I had not seen an orange for four and a half years. Yes, yeah, and there's one here too. Go ahead. Go ahead first. Um, What's her name? It's Ashley again. Um, Ashley. So, um, what happened to your best friend? What happened to your best friend? Cecile, um, I didn't go back to France until our 25th anniversary. I never wanted to go back. And I looked for her, and I don't know what happened. I've never found her. Thank you, Ashley. Hi, my name's Kate, and I was wondering if you ever received the chance to be at Bat Mitzvah? Did you ever get the Bat Mitzvah? No, I was never Bat Mitzvah. There's somebody here, a young man over here. Oh. Okay. Um, my name is Kimmy. I was wondering, you said that when you were 50, you got over your different fears. I was wondering if there was a particular reason you got over them at that age, or... Um, why were you at 50 when you got over your fears? I don't know why. Um, I've had a lot of psychiatric help, so maybe that was the time that it just worked. Thank you, Amy. Uh, where, did, where did you live when you came to America? Um, oh, sorry, my name is Brayden. And where did you live when you came to America? Where did you live? What's his name? Brayden. Brayden. Thank you, Brayden. When I came to America, I came to Brooklyn. So I lived in, that's, Brooklyn is in New York. And that's, you might detect my slight accent. Okay, um, my name's Willie, and I was wondering, um, how did you and Cecile, like, separate? Because you both went to hiding together. How did you and Cecile separate? When my, what's his name? Willie. Willie? When, thank you. When my aunt brought me back to Paris, we lived, in a, I lived in a different area. It was close. I could have seen her, but because I was wearing the star, we tried not to walk in the street too much. So that's how we got separated. Hi, my name's Emily. First off, it's an absolute honor to meet you. You're an amazing woman for doing this. Um, even though it's very hard to relive your life story, are you very grateful and honored to come and share it with us? Thank you. Emily. Th Emily, thank you. Thank you so much. Can you, can you open the door? Oh, I, I'm sorry, I have trouble hearing. So I have this <laughs> lovely young lady, which, uh, Lindsay. Lindsay has been helping me. Thank you, Lindsay. I'm glad you came. Um, do I like telling my story? No. Do I have to tell my story 
yes. It's absolutely important that, I know you read books about the Holocaust, but it's so different when you hear it from a survivor. And there are so many, so few of us left. As the time goes on, as the time goes on, you, all you will see will be videos. Sherry? Yes. As the time goes on, all you will see is videos. And you can see today, when you look at a video, how you can superimpose anything or anyone on a video. So really, it is not the same. Speaking, that's why it's so important for me to speak because there are so few of us left. And I want people to know that I had a family. I loved my family. I miss my family. I miss my sister. My name is Courtney. When you were younger, you said that you sang songs that were both in English, French, and Polish. Can you still fluently speak those languages? I don't speak, mul uh, mul thank Courtney, thank you. I don't speak multiple languages. I speak English, some. <laughs> I speak uh, Yiddish, a little Yiddish. I speak French. I'm not as fluent as I used to be, but I'm still good with it because I really don't have anybody to speak with. And, and uh, I speak a little Spanish. Um, I'm Lucas. After the Holocaust, did you experience any form of PTSD or depression? So, Lucas, did you suffer any uh, form of depression or PTSD after the Holocaust? Yes. Yes. Absolutely yes. Thank you, Lucas. That's very insightful. That really is. Uh, my name is Jacob, Hi, and I was Jacob. wondering, did you ever go back and visit any of the concentration camps? I did. I visited um, Auschwitz. It's about 10% intact. I visited Birkenau. It's about 10% intact. By the way, this is Auschwitz. This is Birkenau over there. You can hear me? This is Birkenau over there. These are houses on both sides, but nobody saw anything, nobody smelled anything, nothing went on, we didn't see, we didn't know what went on. I went to Belsec, None of the, nobody survived from Belsec. I went to Treblinka, nobody survived from Treblinka. And I went to Medanic. Medanic is about 80% intact. They still have ashes. They still have the guardhouse. Still have the crematorium. They have the showers. When you go into the showers, you could see the nails in the showers the people trying to catch the last breath. In the cement, you could see the nails in the cement. Do you know where the word spa comes from? It comes from this commandant who used to take his bath while the crematoria was burning. That's where the word spa comes from. I'll also tell you about this person. Auschwitz had a toilet. Birkenau had a toilet. Medanic did not. So at the end of the day, the last person to go to the bathroom we'd have to empty out the pot by the fence. 
So this person went to the fence to empty out the pot. When he emptied out the pot, the God did not like the way he emptied out the pot. He didn't empty it out the way the God wanted him to do it. He made him get undressed, which was like a little pajama. Basically, it's a pajama, striped pajama with, it says, Jew in the arm. Made him take off the shoes. He had a little blanket. Take off the blanket. Made him stand there for eight hours, naked. The amazing part, the miracle, is that this man survived to tell the tale. This was brutality by one human being. Now, someone asked me yesterday, people maybe did things because of fear. I understand that sometimes we do things because of fear. It makes sense to me. But why the individual brutality? No one told them to be brutal. No one told them to do commit these individual crimes. You can't forgive them. Does that answer your question? Thank you, Jacob. My name is Leo, and I was wondering if you will ever return to Poland after the Holocaust? Oh, yes, I did. That's where I was when you saw the picture that said Miller's Art. That was, yes, I was in Poland, in Warsaw. Actually, I did not want to like it, but to tell you the truth, it's a beautiful city. It really is. Hi, I'm Danielle. I was just wondering, when did you start, like, telling your story? What, I'm the name first. Her, Danielle. Danielle, yeah. Thank you, Danielle. I started telling my story about 23 years ago when I actually moved to St. Louis. Prior to that, I was a business person, and uh, I really didn't have time to tell my story. And besides which, when I arrived in the United States in 1946, it was right after the war. And right after the war, people had lost rather husbands, brothers, fathers, sons, cousins, and they had their own problems. You know, it's like you don't want to listen to somebody else's story. So basically, most of us child survivors regressed, and we decided people don't want to hear about us, so we won't tell our story. When Schindler's List, did you ever see Schindler's List, the movie? When Schindler's List came out, it really sort of revived the Holocaust. We already in California were having groups. Um, we meet once a, month, once a year at different countries and different states, and we tell our story, and we have people that, li that sort of listen to our story, and you'd be amazed. All the stories are different, but all ultimately are the same. So it was about 23 years when I came to St. Louis. I was in a wheelchair for 11 years, and I wanted to, to do something. And the Holocaust Museum had opened up in St. Louis. So they asked me, would you like to tell your story? And I said, I'll try. And it was the first couple years were very, very difficult because I used to break down as I told my story. Now it's still very difficult, but I know I have to do it, so I do it. So thank you. Uh, Tiffany again. Um, I just wanted to know if when you came to the United States, if you face prejudices um, once you were here for your faith? Tiffany, did you face any prejudice when you came to the United States? Any discrimination? Actually, I, honestly, I have to say no. I did not. 
I did not. Oh, hi, I'm Katie. Um, hi, Katie. Oh, I have a Katie, too. Oh. <laughs> well, I've heard from several Holocaust survivors that the events in the Holocaust caused them to lose their faith. Did that happen for you? Did I lose my faith? No, I did not. I believe passionately in God, passionately. The bell's going to ring in just a couple minutes, so... Any closing, any closing thoughts you want to give them? Well, I'd like, first of all, shh, shh, please sit. It's coming to Easter, so I'd like to wish you all a very happy Easter. I know from the questions that you've asked and for your attentiveness, I know that you have a wonderful future ahead of you. You are lovely, lovely young people. And I know that you will remember that you met a Holocaust survivor. There will be deniers who will tell you that it never happened. Don't argue with them because people believe what they want to believe. Or just tell them that you met a Holocaust survivor and walk away. Also, I believe in one word, and the word is respect. I know we talk about love. Love is very important. But if you respect yourself, you will love yourself. If you respect yourself, you will respect the next person. So start with yourself. Start believing in yourself. And you will find that you will have less racism, less anti-Semitism, less anything, because you'll understand that every person that is in this world has a right to be there because they were created by God. And God wants us to be respectful to each and every one of us. We don't have to agree, that's not necessary, but we have to respect. Thank you so much, please help me.